Hello and welcome to a special Ask GC Anything. It's special because you're not really asking GCN, you're asking this man here, Josh Ibert, who is our bikepacking guru. You might recognise him if you've seen our bikepacking in Morocco video that went up earlier in the week. Josh, thank you very much for joining us today. No problem. You rode here, that. presumably? Uh, not this time, no. Slept in a hedge last night? I slept in a hedge, but I drove down. Good stuff. Well, fair enough. Any excuse, I guess. <laughs> uh, anyway, we will crack straight on with questions. Uh, you've left loads and loads for Josh, um, so thank you very much for that. Clearly, a lot of people People really interested in bike packing, um, so let's not waste any time. We're going to begin with food, uh, which is something of a, of a running theme uh, in our Morocco video, isn't it? We had uh, first breakfast, second breakfast, brunch, early lunch, late lunch, afternoon tea, dinner, evening beers, and evening beers most days, and snacks in between as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, and snacks. Um, so anyway, uh, Vincente Guzman asks, uh, what should you eat while you're riding? Gels, bars, those kind of things, or something else? Well, it very much depends on where you are in the world uh, and, the, and the length of your trip. So if you're going for, let's say, a, a one-day ride or maybe kind of a, a kind of a, a short overnighter, you could probably carry most of the food that you need for that particular ride. However, we were going for two or three days, um, so we, we couldn't carry everything we needed for, for this trip. So we stopped um, for cafes when they're available. Um, and also we, we had an overnighter, so we had to plan to, to buy enough food to, to see us through that time. Yeah. So it's very much dependent, as I said, on location, how remote you are. Um, so we had to buy that food for our evening meal quite early on because we weren't sure what, um, what would be available. Um, so it's just about planning ahead uh, and if you think Basically, if you, if you think you, you need food um, or you might not be able to get enough food, always buy more. You can never carry enough food. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's, from my experience, limited experience, I think sports nutrition probably wouldn't be up there as what I would want. Uh, and gels no. also actually are not terribly calorie dense. They're perfect for a day. Yeah. But actually, there's quite a lot of water in those things that you've got and to also, around. And also, you just don't want to eat sort of sweet stuff all day. You want sort of a bit of a mix of everything. And real food really goes down quite well when you've been out all day. Essentially, yeah. you can't replace a meal with energy gels and, and bars for a sustained period of time. No, no, I don't so, think so. Uh, getting the balance right is, is key. And, and well, you probably experienced this. You just kind of eat what you, what you feel like. And your yeah. body kind of naturally tells you what it wants. So yeah. listen to your body and, and you'll generally be all right. And plan ahead when you need to. Um, and that's kind of the best tips ready for, for food. Cool, well we've got some more questions as well on the same subject. Last Reem, what kind of food do you pack on multi-day rides away from civilization without any option to stock up? Well, we, we've got a video on this coming up on uh, on cooking on a bikepacking trip. We do. But, uh, it, it's um, a speciality of mine is bikepacking <laughs> cooking. <laughs> so there, there's staples that we use for our meal. Um, it was rice and, uh, and tin tuna, which not that exciting. However, we also carried things like uh, sweets. Um, they're good, they're, they're essentially this, almost the same as an energy gel in terms of uh, energy delivery. Uh, not quite as sophisticated, but um, yeah, things like sweets, um, cereal bars, if available. Um, quite often we ate little small cakes. Um, they're a bit sugary, but they don't go off. You can carry them easily and they're quite easy to snack. So things like that are really good. Um, again, though, it depends on, on where you are. I mean, we were limited in Morocco as to what was available, but if you're in, say, um, North America or, or Western Europe, supermarkets are abundant and you can pretty much have unlimited choice so you do have to just again get what's what's available and yeah plan ahead if necessary yeah i guess you touched on it briefly uh, items that go off are obviously a no-no yeah. but also uh, items that have got quite a high water content they obviously weigh a lot compared to the kind of calorific benefit yeah. you get so probably kind of drier stuff yeah thought. denser stuff you kind of get a feel for it um, once you've carried a lot of excess food up a mountain you soon realize that that's not really worth it so, no so again it's it's um it's figuring out planning ahead if you can or if you don't know what's coming ahead the planning ahead means carrying it a little bit extra yeah um, because you don't want to run out of food um, no, it, it gets miserable. Trust me. Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> you, you had quite a nice, uh, pleasant experience of that. So. Uh, yeah, I did. Maybe next time we'll make you a bit more miserable. <laughs> no, please don't. Uh, I think to be fair, we, we did stop a lot, didn't we? Because that yeah. was part of the fun, and exactly. it's you know, at the end of the day, bike packing is a holiday, really, a unless holiday. you make it into a race. But that's another story entirely. It's a holiday and adventure, and part of the joy of it is experiencing new cultures. And we ate in local restaurants and cafes, um, and ate local food and dishes, uh, and that's part of the the, the like the enjoyment of it. Now, touch very briefly there on racing. I've got a yep. question from Daniel Ellis, uh, who's saying on multi-day self-supported races, such as the Transcontinental or the Race Across America, how do you prevent saddle sores? Presumably you only have one pair of bib shorts. Yes, you do only have one <laughs> pair of bib shorts. Uh, is it just part and parcel of ultra-endurance cycling that you get a sore bum? Well, I guess uh, it's, it's part of any cycling, really. If 
if you don't look after yourself. And I often say to people who ask about long distance racing, you know, it's all about managing everything, yeah. all aspects, you, managing your bike, your nutrition, your body, your hygiene. Um, so obviously there's a lot you can do to, to stop saddle sores, um, although invariably they can happen. Um, yeah. So keeping clean, showering when you can, um, and washing your shorts when you can. Um, obviously you're not gonna stay in a hotel every night when you're racing. However, every two or three nights it's good to stop uh, just to clean everything really. Yeah. Um, What's the longest you've spent, dare I ask, in one pair of shorts? Um, well, when I won the transcontinental race, that was 10 days. I did wash <laughs> them a few times, but obviously, uh, Sink washing is not quite the same as a proper wash. No. But your standard's lower, so it's, it's Did you have problems right. off the back of that? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, there we go. So sometimes I guess you just gotta suck it up. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's not go into too much detail about that. But no, all right. It took a lot of ibuprofen the last few days to get to Istanbul. <laughs> oh my God, right, okay. Um, but that is a different thing, isn't it? Racing and, and just bike packing. Exactly, bike packing is a bit more of a, a kind of pleasurable experience, I yeah. guess. Yeah, take uh, your time. Take your shorts off from time to time. Or maybe even take two pairs. Crikey, is that allowed? <laughs> well, no, not when you're doing it. No, okay, right. I wanted to suffer. To, <laughs> yeah. to, I didn't want to sort of let, let go of it too, too lightly to start. So. No, okay, good. Um, right, similar hygiene question from uh, KLQC. Uh, do you brush your teeth? Do you take real clothes with you? Um, and then uh, what do you do if you need to go to the toilet whilst you're on your bike in the middle of a mountainside? Do you carry toilet paper? Um, so do you brush your teeth? Yes. Yeah, that's my, my sort of big thing is... Um, Sometimes just, especially if you're doing a race, um, even more so, you're always eating kind of sweet stuff. You're just cramming in the calories um, and just having a toothbrush and brushing your teeth kind of really freshens you up. Yeah, uh, and they're also, pretty light, aren't they? Yeah, and, and general hygiene as well. I mean, it's sensible to do that. You don't want to be getting any uh, fillings or anything like that. No, exactly, no. Um, so yeah, it, I, I find it really freshens you up. Um, and I'm not really one for cutting down my toothbrush like some people do for bikepacking. Yeah. Uh, my view is that if I'm really that tired, I don't want to be mucking around with a tiny toothbrush. I'd rather just have a proper one. Fair enough. Yeah, so. okay. That sounds good. Uh, real clothes? They were kind of real, weren't they? Um, so for our trip, yeah, we took real clothes. Um, like us, well, going on for the previous discussion about hygiene and cleaning shorts and stuff, yeah, we, we had real clothes with us. Yeah. We were staying, um, we stayed in a couple of hotels, we bibbed one night. So yeah, you want to get out your sweaty kit. Like I said, it's it's a it's a pleasurable experience bikepacking. Um, so you want to be able to kind of uh, relax and enjoy it properly. Yeah, I couldn't justify squeezing a pair of jeans in there. Uh, so they were lightweight trekking trousers. Uh, hence that, why it's almost real clothes. The, the height of fashion. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but I guess that's the case, isn't it? When you're when you're stuffing things uh, in your bikepacking bags, then you you literally just weigh them up, don't you? And, exactly. You know, yeah. A pair of jeans is pretty heavy, whereas and they don't compact down very much. No. Having said that, it depends again on your trip. Um, it's a very kind of it's a very personal thing. Bikepacking generally is very personal, and what works for one person may not necessarily work for another. Um, for example, when I was travelling extensively last summer, um, I was away for six months, um, and I took quite a lot of casual clothes because you don't want to just be a grubby cyclist the whole time. On the other really? end of the scale, well, not all the time. <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> On the other end of the scale, transcontinental race. Uh, I didn't take anything really. No. My, my casual clothing was a set of waterproof shorts that <laughs> that I wore if I needed to, um, and my raincoat with nothing underneath. So. Cool, man. You know, all essentials. That's fashionable in some circles, I'm told. Well. <laughs> uh, right, and what about first aid? Uh, Sasha Levy, uh, what first aid do you take? So again, it depends on the trip. Um, so for a race, I, I take fairly minimal, um, and also location as well. So obviously Western Europe, America, you're generally gonna be kind of near help or a pharmacy or something like that. So I take the bare essentials. So I take obviously bandages, um, plasters, um, uh, sterilized wipes, things like that, just to kind of dress a wound. Um, and also basic kind of medication like ibuprofen, um, maybe um, upset stomach, uh, diarrhea. Um, Modium. Modium, that's the one. Yeah. I've not had to take it luckily, but uh, <laughs> I've got some with me. Uh, and also um, kind of hay fever tablets, antihistamines. Um, oh, yeah. Sometimes um, I sort of, if I get stung by an insect or something, or there's something in the air, it can affect you. So yeah, that's a good idea. That one. It's worth uh, it, it make little things like that. Don't don't take up for much space, but they make your life much more comfortable. Yeah. Um, going further afield, if you're in a, a very remote place or somewhere where um, a kind of uh, medicine isn't as available, you may want to think at, about taking other things, maybe antibiotics. Um, or maybe even clean needles. Yeah. Um, stuff that you probably don't ever want to use, but it's kind of worth having just in case. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I guess you do your research, don't you, on your destination exactly. and then make a call. Exactly. As I said before, it's, it's, a, it's a very personal thing and it, 
each trip is different, it depends where you are, how long you're going for, all of these things. So um, yeah, and, and researching and planning is very much part of a bikepacking trip, as I'm sure you learned. Um, yeah, totally. You know, we didn't just rock up in Morocco, we did quite a bit of research. Yeah, and, then even and that was you, fun too. Exactly, yeah, and we, and we planned a lot, and then uh, it was kind of different anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. This kind of, planning gets you so far, but it's still an adventure regardless, so it's um, it's best to be prepared, though, like, yeah. like anything. Yeah, okay, a uh, question from Patrick Carey. Aside from uh, a toothbrush handle, what shouldn't you skimp on? What luxuries? I'd say you always want to have warm clothing and dry clothing with you, um, so waterproofs. Um, always have a dry set of clothes if you're bikepacking. Racing is slightly different um, always have money with you um, and a credit card uh, it tends to get you out of most situations yeah. if, if it gets really bad um, and I probably always take some kind of like survival bag or bivy bag just in case I mean most most of the time you'll never use it um, but if something goes wrong you want to be able to yeah. keep warm and, and look after yourself um, having a mobile phone is is kind of useful in some places other places you won't have reception so you know, it's, it's it's important to have one to yeah. communicate if you need to. We had pretty much full 4G in the middle of the Atlas <laughs> yeah. Mountains, didn't that we? That was incredible. Yeah. But uh, but not everywhere's like that. And you no. go to sort of parts of the UK or America even, you've got nothing. So yeah. it's, um, you can't rely on a mobile phone. Um, but I guess the other thing is always tell people where you're going. Um, you know, safe, that's your safety net. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't skimp on uh, safety. No, no, fair enough. Uh, <clears throat> thinking about safety, actually, uh, Mark James, what is the tag you have on the rear of your seat packs? Is it required in Morocco? Well, this this is, this was your thing, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. You were adamant that we should have them, and absolutely, they make total sense. Yeah, well, um, I, I, like I said, I've, I've travelled quite extensively and with other people, and, and cyclists just aren't that visible, um, especially in, in places um, you know, where it's, there's bright light or it's dusty or hazy, you just don't stand out. Um, and there's been a few kind of sort of deaths and stuff, road, road accidents during events and stuff the last year or so. So I just think anything you can do to be seen um, is is kind of a benefit. I mean, if it slows you down because you've got a little triangle flapping in the wind but stops you getting hit by a car, I know, it's, it's worth it. It's a no-brainer for me. Yeah, where did you get them from, actually? We had a few questions um, about that. I actually brought them in America. Um, or was it Canada? I can't remember. Um, I think it might be MEC or REI or somewhere like that. Okay. Um, so I think some of those big stores uh, in North America have them. Um, in the UK, um, probably just have a check online. Yeah, it's a stupid question, but if you're going to Google it, what would it be called? Uh, I think I'd look for Bicycle Safety Triangle. Or there we go. Bicycle like that, Safety yeah. Triangle. Tap it into Google, see what happens. Um, okay, now let's get on to how do you actually start bikepacking. So this was this was my first bikepacking trip, the Morocco one. Um, we've got a question from uh, Liam Sangaku. What is the best way to start? Gary Thomas um, has asked, actually perhaps you could give uh, the, the story of your first trip and, and what kind of kit and setup did you use? So, so yeah, I mean, how... How do you do it? So my first, I suppose my first bikepacking trip as such um, was a trip in the Dolomites. So it was a two day mountain bike ride. And I didn't even really realize I was bikepacking as such. I kind of realized afterwards. So we, we did a trip um, around the, um, the, the Dolomites. Um, and basically we had a sleeping bag and some clothes and a backpack. And uh, we did this trip and it was really epic. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then it was only kind of a couple of years later I realized that, that was probably bikepacking, <laughs> but my first proper, you know, when I set out to do a bikepacking trip as such, um, was when I, um, I, I was really inspired to do the Transcontinental Race. The first year it was um, uh, launched in 2013, but I was a bit scared, so I, I didn't do it. It's quite daunting, it's a, it's a long way to ride, and yeah. I'd never ridden, you know, much over 100 miles before, so I was a bit, I was scared. Yeah, uh, fair <laughs> So I, instead, instead I, um, I watched the race and I was like, oh damn, I should have done it, um, and I booked, after, straight after the race, I, I just brought all the kit, which which is an investment. Um, but I, I figured that I definitely wanted to do this, um, and then I basically looked at the uh, the cheapest flights a thousand miles away, which happened to be Slovenia to Ljubljana. Um, nice. And I flew there and I rode home, and uh, and that was that really. And then then I knew that. That I loved it and I wanted to do do more. And the yeah. next year I entered the Transcontinental Race. It's, it's funny, you know, because obviously the the memory of uh, you know my first trip was still very fresh in the mind, and it does feel like you build up to something, but actually once you're out there on the road, it seems an awful lot easier. You know, it's Definitely. become it's very a very natural thing, and you don't even need. Although I was blessed with an awful lot of amazing equipment, you know, actually you could just go with uh, you know, like I said, credit card and some money. And you ride to a hostel or something, and then ride home again the next day. That counts, right? Definitely. There's so many different ways you can do a bikepacking trip, and we 
we, we did it one way and we used a certain sort of set of kit, but you, you don't have to use exactly what we used. It's a very personal thing and what works for one person might not work for another person. But the biggest thing about going on a bikepacking trip is just, just doing it, just getting out the door and not being scared because that was my thing to start with. I was like, oh God, it's a long way. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I'm going. But once you once you get out there, it's okay. No, yeah. I'm sure you found it. I'm sure you were kind of a bit pessimistic before you went, but it was all right. Yeah, uh, yeah, apprehensive. I think is the word. I, uh, you know, I kind of I knew we'd be fine, but I didn't quite know what to expect. And actually, it was just, it was just cool. It's just a bike ride, really. Yeah, just you carrying all your stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. And even carrying my stuff wasn't that bad. I kind of thought it'd be really boring, but it wasn't at all. No, no, you just get used to it and you just settle into it. And um, once you've done it once, you, you kind of it's a bit addictive, really. Yeah, Hopefully, yeah. You know. Well, that's it. Watch this space. <laughs> uh, right, um, Sam Leach. What were the mistakes that you learnt on your first couple of bike packing trips? So after you went to Slovenia, you got home. What did you think? Oh man, I should have done this. I shouldn't have taken that. I needed whatever. It was. It was more kind of, um, the mistake I made was not believing enough in my ability. You can actually ride a lot further than you think when you've got all day to do it. If you look at, if, say for example, riding, I don't know, 150 miles a day. If you look at it as a 150 mile bike ride, it's a long way. Yeah. But if you do three 50 mile bike rides with a, a, a lunch, second lunch, <laughs> second breakfast, just coffee stops, it'd break it down in smaller chunks, it's much easier. So actually believing in yourself and believing you can do the distance over a whole day, yeah. um, it, things, distance is quite achievable. Um, and then there's all the equipment things. Um, so certainly in the transcontinental race, the first time I did it, I carried sleeping bag, bivy bag, all this stuff. And a few days in, I was like, oh, I just can't be bothered to unpack it. And I just <laughs> slept on the floor basically. <laughs> so the next year I took barely anything. Yeah. Um, you know, once you've carried all that extra equipment across Europe and you didn't use it, you soon realize that, that, that that's a mistake and that you yeah. should probably sort of um, cut down on your kit. And I'm sure there's stuff you used on this kit, on this trip, um, stuff you didn't use and stuff you did use. And I'm, I'm sure you would go back and, and chew things differently. Well, I was, I was, uh, had the luxury of you basically spoon feeding me exactly <laughs> yeah. what to take so I, I feel like you know i didn't make uh i didn't overpack and i didn't underpack did you but, miss the extra two pairs of pants that you didn't put in uh, well i mean i did <laughs> but uh but the one mistake i did make was actually how i packed it and yeah. um i'll spare you all the details but effectively <laughs> i put uh my toilet paper that i packed right in the middle of my uh, handlebar bag, the least accessible place going, and uh, and that was really annoying. Uh, Fortunately for Simon, I've made that mistake before, so I had some really available. Josh, help me out <laughs> without me having to unpack everything. But anyway, there we go. Um, right, what about costs then? So we've got a couple of questions on that. Nat Nail Levi's, uh, what's the minimum cost of travel like this? And uh, Sanosa Adi Ardana said, uh, how much money did it cost? So not taking into account the bike and the kit and things, what's the kind of, you know, I mean, it is cheap, isn't it, mm. bikepacking? Well, that's it's about as cheap as it gets, I guess, for one a of the, One of the big appeals for me was um, was the cost of it. You know, I, before I got into bikepacking, I was racing a lot of mountain bike kind of stage races. Um, so, for example, I did the Cape Epic in, in South Africa, and that was nearly £3,000 for a week trip, which is pretty extortionate. Yeah, that is punchy. Bearing in mind, we went to um, Morocco, and well, flights were maybe... 250, 300 pounds. Yeah, we booked late, but they could be, you know, 100 pound return. You can get, there's a lot of cheap flights, um, especially in Europe. Um, one, uh, like, like I say, the, the expense of the kit, but once you have it, the cost of actually sort of traveling isn't that much. So we were, what we paying maybe about 10 or 15 pounds a night. Yeah. Um, for the accommodation that we had, and it was nice accommodation. With, with food as well. Um, I suppose eating out, if you're eating out every meal, that's where the cost adds up in some countries. In some it? countries, yeah. For example, in America, uh, campsites were $20. Wow. So it's camping every night, and that's the cheapest option. But we were getting like a night in a hotel and food in Morocco. So it depends where you go. Um, some countries are going to be more expensive. Um, quite often, it might be more expensive to get to a country. Um, because of the flight cost, but once you get there, it's cheaper. So yeah. that's also worth bearing in mind. So for example, Southeast Asia is, is basically a pound for everything. Yeah. <laughs> pound for a beer, pound for a meal. Um, nice. And then it's normally about, sort of, works out about $10 um, for hard accommodation. So you almost don't need to camp or bivy then because yeah. it's, uh, it's relatively cheap. Yeah. Um, however, Europe is more expensive. So you might want to camp more or wild camp or bivy um, and that brings the cost down. So overall, it's very cheap. Um, we probably spend, I don't know, what was it, about about 300 pounds probably in the week? Yeah. Each or so? Uh, 
Yeah, Not I need to do the maths. But yeah, I mean, it was. It did seem very reasonable, didn't it? Yeah. Um, right, well, there you go then. So, <clears> effectively, <throat> bikepacking can be super cheap, but depending on your destination. Uh, you were touching on camping out and bivvying. Um, Michael McDermott, always good for a comment. Uh, he says it ties quite nicely in with the uh, going too far topic on the GCN show. You know you love cycling too much when you have to sleep rough, but call yourself a bike packer. <laughs> uh, but thinking about sleeping out, uh, we have got some more uh, sensible questions. Um, from uh, Davin on Twitter and uh, Ian as well in the uh, comments on the YouTube. Um, how do you choose where to sleep in a bivvy? Um, and are you flexible as to where you stop for the night versus your original plan? Uh, well, we've got a, a whole video on this coming up at we some do. point. Um, so it's worth saying that. So we won't get into too much detail now. Um, but we, on this particular trip, we kind of, we, we knew that we needed to sleep out that night, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it was more of a case of what was suitable at, at the right time so we didn't know in advance what was going to be there or what the train was going to be like um uh, we, we got to the point around probably half 10 we were really high on a mountain and there was a big thunderstorm up above and we thought well it'd be kind of nice to bivy now but it's probably not very suitable to be sleeping at 2000 meters yeah um with a storm coming in so we just then decided between us that we would start looking for a place in the next kind of half hour or so. And once we found somewhere, we'd stop. Um, and as it was, we found a really awesome place that was yep. sheltered. And, and that was the key really, it was shelter, um, out of the storm, um, relatively comfortable. I mean, they were quite comfy for rocks, weren't they? Yeah, not bad actually. <laughs> and the thorn bush that uh, was my pillow was, was just brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that was it though. It was very much on the hoof, which kind of surprised me actually, but when you actually wake up the next morning and you realise that you don't need very much if you're Not just sleeping out somewhere. And the other thing is if you're tired enough, you, you don't really mind so much. It's, it's more about kind of, uh, you, ju you just want to sleep anywhere. Or, yeah. Or at least stop, and that's the main thing. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, so well, actually, yeah, that leads <laughs> on to another question um, from Richard Elston. Uh, I get the feeling, Richard, that you're quite an experienced uh, bikepacker slash ultra endurance racer. He's saying, can we have some tips on how to sleep? I'm always still quite awake when I stop, even when my body is tired. Anything you can do to help you sleep? Do you warm down a little bit? Uh, do you ride slowly for a bit? And also, how do you manage your temperature when your body's producing heat from riding and then it gets cold in the night? Uh, yeah, that's, they're very good valid points, actually. Um, certainly, when you when you just stop and try and get in a bivvy bag and sleep, it just doesn't happen. Your body's kind of still pumping. There's a bit of, a, bit of adrenaline. So what I tend to do is when I... Um, I, I kind of have a time where I think, well, it's time to sleep in the next half hour, hour or so. Um, and then I start looking for a location to, to bivy. Um, and I kind of back off and just go really easy. It's kind of like a warm down, but also lets your body kind of naturally kind of wind down after a, a day. Um, and then you kind of just, just kind of have a 10 minutes just to chill out um, once you've stopped. The thing is to keep warm because obviously you, you're riding hard um, or you're, you're, you're moving all day, yeah. so your, your body does generate heat. So the, the, the key is to keep that heat in because after about two or three hours, your body does kind of cool down and you will find yourself getting cold. Yeah. So if you can keep the heat in as long as possible, that that does help. Um, equally, it works the other way. You get in, wrap up, and you're still warm because you're... <laughs> That was my mistake. I got too hot after an hour. I, you know, when you wake up in a sleeping bag, you're like, oh, oh my God, I need to get out, I need to get out. And uh, yeah, I wore, wore way too many clothes. But uh, anyway, it's a experience. nice problem to have. Yeah, it's experience. So the, the thing to do is kind of maybe have a few layers on and don't zip them up or whatever, and then you can sort of wrap up later on. Um, I guess you've got to try it and find out what works for you because everyone's different. Um, yeah, yeah, but that tip of uh, just going steady for a bit, and also so you didn't get too sweaty, I seem to remember you saying, so you can actually dry out a little bit exactly, so you yeah. don't jump in. One of the worst it. things has been really sweaty and then getting in, into your bivy bag, sleeping, and then you, the, the sweat kind of makes you really cold later on. So. Yeah, experienced viewers of GCM will know that I don't have that problem, <laughs> so yeah, that's absolutely fine. Uh, right, okay, we are getting towards the end of our questions. Uh, I will point out that we've steered away from kind of tech questions because we're going to ask Josh all the tech questions and they're going to be over on the tech channel. So make sure you check out that video as well if you want to know a bit more about the bikes and the equipment that we're using. Um, we've got a really cool question from Diana Thero. Sorry, I've butchered your name. Um, how do we find gravel roads for routes? Uh, how did Josh find the route specifically? Uh, was it apps? Was it maps? Was it word of mouth or all of the above? So yeah, that's a really good question because at the end of the day, you look at a map of Morocco and it's, it's quite a big country. It's quite daunting to have to pick stuff. And yet we rode an amazing route. Yeah, I think that was probably more luck than judgment. <laughs> um, Don't admit but... that on camera. <laughs> there, there is, I use Google Maps as an amazing tool. Um, you can find a lot of stuff on there um, and the street view thing does 
kind of show you a lot of roads. Generally, if there's a road on Google Maps that doesn't street view, then that's probably gravel. Yeah. Um, that's, that's my general rule of thumb. If you zoom in really, really close, you can, you can find small roads that aren't very obvious. They're generally gravel roads. Um, or you can use a satellite imagery to check stuff. Or you can use an app. There's various ones out there. So things like Camus actually allow you to sort of, um, sort of specify the, the surface type you want to ride on. Um, but it's kind of experience too. I mean, you just know that you go up in a big mountain like that in a country like Morocco, it's probably going to run out of tarmac at some point. Yeah. Um, I mean, th we were lucky. We thought that th th there'd be a lot more gravel than there was. But it turns out the road had been relatively recently um, tarmacked. Yeah. What was so. really interesting about that, though, is that until we got to that road, all the local knowledge out there suggested that actually we'd be off our bikes and carrying mm. them for quite a big portion of time. And then when we did get there, like you say, we found it wasn't gravel at all, it was tarmac yeah. for a lot of it. Um, and, and we kind of were sat there going, well, hang on a minute, the locals say there's no road, but Google Maps says there's a road. And weirdly enough, Google was right. Yeah, it's a bit scary. It is a little bit freaky. Um, and also, it's not just the, the map function on Google as well. Also, satellite imagery was great because you can yeah. zoom in kind of a long way and you can actually kind of get a feel for the surface uh, of the road just literally from aerial so, yeah. views. Or the other option is just wing it and see what happens. And yes. Yeah. You know, a lot of people do just do that and, and see what happens. And, um, and then you can... A lot of people document their rides, so you can research other people's rides. There's some really good websites out there with loads of resources. Yeah. Um, like I said, there's apps like Kamut, um, Rami GPS. People have put these uh, these routes on there. So use people's other people's experience, ask questions, speak to people like like Simon, who's been there and done it. Oh yeah. <laughs> and he'll be able to tell you I've what got, it's like. Got the mug on the outside of my saddlebag to prove it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Last two questions then. Uh, on a theme, Jonathan Batty and Vincente Guzman, um, training. So we've already tried to encourage people just to go out there and do it. What about the fitness element? Do you need to be fit to go bike packing? Uh, obviously you do before the transcontinental and, yeah. and ultra races like that. But, but yeah, what about if you're literally just setting out from your front door? Well, one of the great things about cycling is that the more you do it, the better you get. So actually doing a really long kind of bike ride you, you kind of it depends on the distance but for example over a month or so trip you just get fitter as you go along yeah. so you don't necessarily need to turn up really fit i'd say generally you don't have to be in race condition to do a bike packing trip um we did um it was about 300 miles worth of riding over probably about three days worth of actual riding um but you could do that over six days you don't have to to do it in the time we did it. Yeah. That's the great thing about it. It's, it's a personal thing, like I've said before. So if you want to do less distance over a longer time, then that, that, if that works for your fitness levels, then that's the thing to do. If you really want to push yourself, you can almost ride it in one hit. Yeah. Um, but the point is that fitness, uh, as long as you're relatively fit, as long as you ride relatively regularly, um, it shouldn't be an excuse um, to not do a, do a trip. And, yeah. and your body will actually go a lot further than you think. It's quite often your mind that holds you back. So. Uh, just give it a go. Yeah, I would have thought <clears throat> the the two things to watch out for, not in terms of your fitness, but just how used to sitting on a bike you are, because otherwise yeah. you could end up with a prematurely sore bum uh, or any kind of overuse injury. So if you are riding day after day, even if it's just you know very gently, but you know those are the kind of times where you might pick up some kind of tender nights or whatever. So so it'd be worth being put it planning your trip within your own kind of. Um, your your cycling history if you like Definitely. so you, you don't you don't completely just go over the top yeah i wouldn't sort of if you've never bike packed before i wouldn't go for like a a massive thousand mile trip in like a week that's that's probably asking for trouble but um but yeah if you, as long as you're comfortable with with the goal and obviously push yourself a little bit but as long as you think you can achieve it for the first one i go for it use it as experience learn what works learn what doesn't work and then you can take that as a foundation for further trips and you'll find that you can do a lot more than you think you can um once you've kind of got your head around it, it becomes a lot easier. Yeah, awesome. Josh, thank you very much for answering those questions. As Josh mentioned a couple of points in this, this video, we've got a load of how-to videos coming up on the channel, so make sure you stay tuned to that. And as I mentioned earlier on, we also have another Ask Josh, uh, but going into the tech side of things, so the equipment that we're using, the bikes that Josh has been riding. Uh, so make sure you head over to the tech channel to check that out. Uh, I guess now we've got to decide whether we go for a second breakfast or brunch or an early lunch, really. So uh, obviously food's still the dominating factor. We should probably decide for coffee, I'd have thought. Yeah, okay, let's <laughs> do that. Uh, anyway, yeah, thanks again, Josh. Make sure you give this video a big thumbs up and we'll see you over on the tech channel.